Association. These presentations came out of me being the manager at the Circle Community Garden for the city of Midland. And one of my jobs was to give a presentation or two a month at the garden regarding gardening subjects while we were at the whims of Mother Nature. <laughs> so we would get maybe one, maybe two. I think the highest we had was maybe seven. <laughs> so that wasn't working. After my first year there and I knew I was going to go back the next season, I'm like, I need to figure something else out. So as a master gardener, and I said, well, hey, I've got a huge resource here. So we started a collaboration between the City of Midland, the Midland County Master Gardener Association, and Creative 360. And this is what has come out of it. Free gardening presentations for everybody who wants to learn something. The first 45 minutes will be a presentation, approximately. The second 45 minutes will be whatever question is on your mind, whether it has to do with the presentation or not. We have a lot of gardeners in this room. We have a lot of master gardeners in this room. Would the master gardeners please stand up? Stand up. You too, miss. <laughs> so, you can see we have a lot of master gardeners. Between all of us, we probably have an answer to whatever question that you have regarding gardening. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Clarification. Okay, so yeah, sign the sheet so I can prove to my city boss that I'm actually doing something. That's always good. And we're going to talk tonight on planning your garden. I even have a little clicker. This is so cool. Hopefully I can use it. So, planning your garden with a focus on food. Community gardening, you know, that's where this is coming from. I try to make them enjoyable for even people who aren't in a community garden. There's so many different kinds of community gardens. I just did a presentation on that last week. And in the city of Midland, we have one of almost every kind of community garden. And so I might give that at some point too. Um, with a focus on food, so we're going to... Uh, focus on vegetables in a community garden, and the concepts that we're going to discuss are really basic, and most of them pertain to most aspects of gardening in general. Um, so we're going to go through guidelines, ideas, and hopefully give you some answers. And the most important thing, I put this in all of my presentations, gardening is not rocket science. You do it to have fun, hopefully. You do it to have fun. So you need to have fun. Um, this on the left-hand side was a bed at the community garden last year. Um, I said, you got to have fun. So she planted her greens in an argyle. Um, you know, those all grew and she harvested them and then she planted summer vegetables. But she had fun with that. And then we had a new gardener and he said, how do I plant my lettuce. I said, how do you want to plant your lettuce? <laughs> and so he made a lettuce spiral. And I thought that was really pretty cool. You, you can do it. You don't have to do straight little rows, you know. Have fun with it. So <clears throat> um, where are you going to plant your garden? That is the first consideration when you're planning a garden. Um, so you need to consider your landscape, your soil, and your sun and your shade. In a community garden, your location and your soil are picked out for you, but you need to know from which direction the sun <coughs> shines. This will determine which taller growing plants will go in front of ones that prefer shade. In the summertime, if you want some lettuce, you need to give that lettuce some shade because mm -hmm. it is a cool season crop. If it doesn't have enough shade, it's just going to bolt and you won't have any lettuce left. So if you're going to have tall tomatoes or maybe some cucumbers. You could plant your lettuce right next to it in between your other things and it can take advantage of all of that shade in there. Um, and then of course the taller plants that need a lot of sun like the tomatoes, 
you want to make sure that they get up and they get their sun that they're going to need. And they're not going to be, like if you plant cucumbers and then you plant the tomatoes right next to them and the cucumbers grow tall enough, they take all of the sun and your tomatoes aren't going to get any. So you, those are things you have to take into consideration. Um, how do you know from which way the sun shines? Research. Ask other gardeners, <coughs> drive by daily and note the sun path, read up on the crops you would like to grow and ask your garden manager. Now, if you're growing at home, just sit out in your yard for a while. Make notes. Um, say you want to plant next to your garage because that's like a really good place, you think. <laughs> but if you take notes on where the shadow from the garage is, and you don't have at least six to eight of sunshine right there, you're probably not gonna want very many plants there. There's some things that will grow in shade, but if you're talking summer vegetables like tomatoes, pumpkins, you know, something like that, they need a lot of sun, and they need a lot of bright sun, and they need a long day of sun. Unfortunately, our growing season here is not very long, um, so some of it you might have to start before you even put it out so that you can, Brussels sprout, you have to start those because we do not have long enough growing season days to grow Brussels sprouts into any kind of size. So that's where your research will come in. Okay, what are you gonna grow? Vegetables, herbs, flowers. In a community garden, you'll have a list of unwelcome plantings. A long list. <laughs> These may be amended from year to year based on experience. Mostly they'll include items that will make life miserable for the person who is assigned to your bed next year. If you're growing in your own yard, you want to keep that in mind too. If you want to try to grow sweet potatoes, <coughs> I found out you cannot vertically grow sweet potatoes like, and they don't stay in one spot. They will take up as much room as they can get, and they grow way deep down. If you put sweet potatoes someplace and you don't get them all out, they will come up year after year, after year, after year. After year. Um, so it, it's like that. If you, I mean, you plant mint, mint spreads. You want to plant mid, mint in an area that is really confined so that it won't spread through your whole yard. So if you have any question on that, you can ask your garden manager. Um, so here, mint, strawberries, sunflowers, asparagus, rhubarb, grapes, fruit trees, blueberries, and other bush berries. Those are some of the ones that are on our list because, of, well, asparagus and rhubarb, those are perennials. So you can't plant them in a bed that you're not going to have next year. I actually, at our garden, I have planted a pot of strawberries and a couple of rhubarb plants so that we have those available for the gardeners, but that's not something you can plant in your bread. If you want to plant those in your home, do your research, make sure you get them in the right space, and they will come up for you year after year and you'll be able to harvest. Both of those you don't want to harvest for the, about the first three years. You want them to get established before you start cutting them back, especially the asparagus. If you start cutting it before it gets bigger than a pencil, it'll stay wimpy its whole life. So you really need to let it just get going. Um, sweet potatoes are discouraged. Um, pumpkins. We did have a pumpkin in our community garden one year. Um, they didn't know it was a pumpkin <laughs> when they planted it, or maybe they did and they just didn't think about it. And I, they said, well, what do we do now? And I said, get a really strong trellis. <laughs> and they did. They took one of the pallets, they cut it in half, they leaned it against each other, and they connected it with zip ties, and it was strong enough for the pumpkin. I told them that they would also need a sling underneath their pumpkin to keep it from hanging down because the stem came over the top and as the pumpkin got bigger 
it put pressure on that stem until it was eventually just like a piece of paper. And at that point, the pumpkin stopped growing. So they didn't do the sling, which they could have had a huge pumpkin if they would have done that. Um, tomatillos, I'm not a big fan of. They are bug magnets. When you get a plant at the store, look it over really careful before you take it home. If it has any kind of little crawly something on it, or there were some next to it, walk away. <laughs> because there will be eggs or something on the plant that you take home and you will not get rid of them. Um, yes, that's the last note on there. So other than the items on the list, you will want to plant what you want to use. If you don't like radishes, and you don't know anyone who likes radishes, then you probably won't want to plant radishes. Think about what you buy when you go to the store. These are going to be so much better than the ones in the store, but that's a whole nother session. Um, so you can always leave your unwanted produce to a pantry. We had somebody plant 10 tomato plants in a bed one year. <laughs> I said, um, that's a lot of tomato plants. But they planted them like they were going to plant them at home, where you might get six, seven, maybe a dozen tomatoes off of it if you're lucky. Unfortunately, or fortunately, we amend our beds <laughs> in the community garden with the top notch soil. And their plants all got like seven feet tall, and they were harvesting tomatoes like three dozen a day off of them. They got tired of them. <laughs> so at that point, you can, you can donate them. We have a lot of places in town that you can donate produce to, or your neighbors leave, you know, leave a basket on the porch, ring the bell, and run away. <laughs> uh, let's see. <clears throat> Along with everything that you know you're going to want, experiment. Look at these catalogs and pick something out that you've never tried before. There are so many new heirloom varieties of the most amazing vegetables that you will ever see and not in a store. You won't get them in a store because they're not mass producible, they're not shippable, they're not storable, so they're not something that people want to put money in to sell. But they're so good and I can't even begin to go through the list because you just have to get some of these seed catalogs and some of these seed catalogs like Baker Creek um, I think Seed Savers time they have little articles in them that will explain you know all about cucumbers and the different types of cucumbers and what you need to plant them what you need to start the seeds how long you need to start the seeds before you can put them out what you need to do in order to get the seeds used to being outside. You know, it's take them out, you put them in. You take them out, you put them in. It's a process to do that. You can't just grow your seeds in your house on your windowsill. Take them out and plant them. <laughs> Doesn't work that way, unfortunately. That part's a little rocket science, but it's fun. And you can <coughs> Companion planting. Um, plants compete for the same nutrients in your soil. Some plants can share the nutrients, while others produce nutrients that other plants can use. So planting some plants next to each other is a good thing, but planting others near each other is not. They don't play well with others. So you can find many companion planting charts and guides online, and I have just a few of the links here. Um, actually, I was going to... Oh, no, next slide. There we go. Here's a couple of them right here. So, probably really, really hard to see, huh? Um, let's see. Beans. They like most vegetables and herbs, but they do not like... I can't even read that. <laughs> garlic. I know onion. Oh, onion, mm -hmm. garlic. I don't know what that says. Oh, yeah. 
That's why the links are there. <laughs> um, what about this one? So this one's interesting. So beans, you come over here, it likes broccoli and carrots and cauliflower, it doesn't like chives, onion family, onions, garlics. Um, <laughs> likes corn and cucumbers, it doesn't like garlic and leeks. <coughs> it doesn't like marigolds. Really? Um, and then onions, and it doesn't like peppers. So that's really easy. I like this one. This one I don't know about. Squash. It likes nasturtium, corn, and marigolds, and it doesn't like Irish potatoes. That's a little prejudice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if you if you read anything, um, the Indians used to grow what they called the three sisters, and they would grow corn with beans and squash. Beans and squash. So the corn would grow up. The pole beans would grow on the corn, and the squash would cover the soil so you didn't have as many weeds. And that's really where it all started, this companion planting. And you can find a lot of that online. Okay, let's see. When? When are you going to plant? Um, spring? Summer? Late summer? Morning? Afternoon? Evening? During a rainstorm? I amended this and it's not amended. Oh no. Um, are you going to plant by the moon? Are you going to plant on a full moon? Are you going to plant on a new moon? That is another session that we're going to have next year. We have somebody studying all of that and so we'll have a presentation on moon planting. So that should be really interesting next year. So after the date you're given be given to be able to plant for a season in a community garden, like ours is usually the middle of April to the middle of October. Um, read from <coughs> the crops you've chosen, which can include online books, catalogs, seed packets. Your seed packets are a wealth of information. Find out what the optimal conditions are. Um, you may need to adapt your list to ensure you get the most out of your planting season. Now that includes succession gardening. <coughs> so say it's really cool out, but you can get a start on spinach and your cool weather crops. Um, get your broccoli started, um, some of your lettuces, not tomatoes, not cucumbers. Those are all warm season crops, so you need to know your crops. But if you plant in April and May, you can harvest those, especially the greens, and then plant your warm season crops in there when those are done. So you're going to be getting the most out of your area the whole season. Uh, let's see. If they have a long growing season and need full sun, you may need to opt out of a few of those and to switch to some with less than full sun needs and shorter growing times in order to use the succession growing methods. Um, if you want to plant corn, you may want to plant a smaller area of corn because that's going to be there all season. Um, so you want to make sure that you have enough room to plant everything that you want to grow. <coughs> Yeah. So when you pull a crop after an optimal, <laughs> no one to pull a crop. Oh, but it's still got two flowers on it. Yeah, they're not going to ripen. Pull them. Put something else in there. It's not, it's not a little baby. <laughs> it's not a puppy. Just pull it, compost it, put something else in there. I know it's hard the first few times. <laughs> then you get just mean. You just go, oh, you're not doing what I want you to do. I had somebody, he had six eggplants. They were not doing what he wanted them to do. They weren't growing fast enough. He pulled them all and threw them in the compost bin and planted something else. I'm like, okay. <laughs> um, how are you going to do this? Um, bed, pot, trellis. So we'll cover more of those in the April presentation, which is small space gardening. Um, are you going to plant them in rows, mounds, hills, spirals, individual plants? 
Again, have fun, experiment. There's no one way to plant. And you never know, you might figure out something that nobody else has figured out before. Seeds, plants, or store bought, mail order. You can <coughs> mail order plants. I was finding all of these strange plastic trays at the garden last year. I'm like, what in the world? Finally talked to somebody who had one. They mail ordered these little plants that came in these plastic compartments and they were just ready to plant. Some of the most beautiful onions I've ever seen come out of that garden. They got online. It was amazing. Um, Let's see, our growing season here is about four to five months. Anything growing in April, May, September, or October definitely needs to be cold tolerant. So when you're doing your succession garden, you're gonna have some cold season, you're gonna have some warm season, and you're gonna have more cold season. Our gardeners have to be out by the middle of October, so that's really cutting off their cold season. Otherwise here, if, you, if you're growing in your yard, and you get some spinach out there, or some kale, you can put some kind of cover over it and you can be harvesting that at least into December, if not all winter, depending on where it is and what you cover it with. I used to cover my herb garden with some sticks and visqueen and I was harvesting all winter long. So it all depends on what you do with it. You can, you can do it here. There is um, the speaker at the Know and Grow last month, Nikki Jabour. She gardens in Nova Scotia. She gardens all year round. She has books out if you want to know how to do it. Like her on her Facebook page, look at her blog, or buy some of her books, and she tells you how to do it. How do you spell it? J A B. B O R. O R? Yeah. Not O U R? Yeah, I think it's O U R. No, I think it's just J A B B O R. Okay. Nikki. N I K C K I? Yes. Okay. Uh, cold tolerant crops will include for spring spinach, lettuces, radishes, charred kale, peas, leeks green onions, parsley, mustard greens, turnip kohlrabi, cabbage, broccoli, collard greens. For fall, you're gonna look at beets. Well, beets will start growing in the summer, but you can leave any root crop in the ground and store it there if you put a big enough coverage over the top of it. You can't do that in the community garden, but at home, <coughs> if you have some growing really good, if you put a nice mulch over the top of it, then, and you keep that soil halfway warm, just enough to dig it up, then you can keep them there pretty much all winter, right? Yeah. I'm looking at our, our vegetable gardener over here for his, yes. <laughs> Um, so there again, you have the sea celeries will grow all summer and they will stay good in, in the cool weather. Cabbages, and endive, potatoes. Potatoes, again, it's a root crop. You can leave it in for quite a while. Potatoes, they have the most beautiful flower. You guys got to see the flowers on the potatoes. And what happens is they put up their plant. Some of them will put actually little seed balls out, which is really cool too. And then when they're ready to harvest, the plant will die. And you'll go, oh no, the plant's dying. No, it's supposed to. And it will die all the way back. And when it's there, then you just dig up the potatoes. So I usually, and I grow mine in a black pot on my driveway. So I usually get like two rounds of crops out of those because it's so warm. They'll grow up, they'll die back, I'll harvest them, I'll put the smaller ones back in, they'll grow up, they'll die back, and then I harvest it for the winter. Um, heat tolerant crops. Beans, corn, <coughs> cucumber, eggplant, gourds, melon, okra, peppers, tomatoes. I can't tell you how many times this one gardener puts out his cucumbers in April. <coughs> they die. He puts out more cucumbers. They die. He puts out more cucumbers. They die. 
Finally, he gets to some warm weather, like the end of May, June, puts out more cucumbers. They live, yay! <laughs> So because our growing season is shorter up here, most of the above crops need to be started so you can place the whole plant in the ground at an appropriate time. And you will be able to find that out when you research your crop. If you have a crop that takes 90 days, you're probably going to have to start that before you put it in the ground. Um, what are some? Some tomatoes take a really long time, especially the bigger ones like the beef steaks, um, the Brussels sprouts. Anything that needs to get big, um, cabbages, um, corn. Um, peppers and eggplant tend to take Some them. peppers and eggplant, <coughs> especially the bigger, bigger ones. I like to grow the little fish peppers. They don't take this long. <laughs> but anything with a shorter, I'm, I'm impatient. I'm an impatient gardener. So because, um, so there's just one link there. Which veggies for which season? I found that to be a real informative, even though it's bonnie plants, <laughs> but it was a real informative little link there. Um, when working with a space, we gotta cover this. Uh, a lot of people do the square foot gardening. Uh, it works out really well for them. There's a lot online about it. There's some links here. Um, you, it tells you how to build the box how to, what to fill it with, which I would just go to Morgan's composting. But, um, and then how to do the grid. And then they even have how many plants to plant in each little square. It makes it really almost foolproof. We did have one gal growing them last year in our garden, and she pretty much followed this. And, um, she, her little squares were so full because her soil was so good and her plants grew so well that she didn't have enough room for her plants using this. So when she did her succession, she planted fewer plants than what it said in her little squares because they were just growing too well, which is not a bad problem to have. <coughs> um, of course, much of gardening is dependent on the weather. Uh, one crop could do better one year, but totally flop the next. Uh, pests take their cues from the weather. <sighs> Two years ago, when we had all that rain, it washed all of the soil and nutrients out of our raised beds. It took about three months for it to start building up nutrients again before the plants even started growing again. And while the plants were stressed like that, this is a whole new, we gotta have Ellie in here, the entomologist, to talk about how plants scream, and pests hear that scream, and they go, oh, that plant's in trouble, let's go eat it. <laughs> Cause it's true. You have a stressed plant, whether you forgot to water it, or maybe it's getting too much sun where it is, or whatever, the pests are gonna hear that and they're gonna migrate right towards that plant and they're gonna go, I want this one. And as soon as they get on it, then they call all their friends and it's a party. <coughs> um, so you wanna listen to your other gardening friends. You wanna keep an eye on sources like crop reviews and MSU online resources. MSU has a ton of online resources. Um, I have a, one of them down. This is the main, oh, I knew I'd do that. <coughs> um, field crops, even though it has to do with field crops, if so, a pest comes up on their radar, if it's down in Lansing, it's gonna be about two weeks before it gets here, and it will get here. If they say they have cucumber wilt down there, you can bet it's on its way. <coughs> or the tomato blight. If you hear anywhere, yeah, just think about pulling your tomatoes right away so it doesn't even get to it. I would just start again next year. Um, and okay, so this is where we get to the other part. I know it, it was on the description that we were gonna talk about incorporating 
vegetables and herbs into your landscaping. So they actually have a name for it now. It's called foodscaping. And there's all kinds of articles and books out there that you can read on it. Basically, your edible crops are easy to incorporate between your bushes, bulbs, or flowering plants. You can put in a trellis for your vining crops, like cucumbers, tomatoes, beans. Just lean a trellis up against your house and plant something there, and it'll grow up then. Um, your bushing crops can go in containers. Potatoes, like the ones I grow in my driveway. Um, bush beans, peppers are great in pots. Um, any greens, sometimes if you have it up high enough and you can put some kind of a cover over it, you can protect them from the rabbits and the squirrels. Sometimes. <laughs> um, strawberries are great in a container. What I do with mine is I throw them in a container so the rabbits can't get to them and I can put a cover over them. And then I just take them down in the basement at the end of the season with all the rest of my pots that I have outside and put them under. I put the strawberries back so they're not under the grow light, so they're not like growing. They're just like, they go dormant back there. So that's all I do with mine. Um, you could plant other crops and herbs as borders. Uh, kale, a lot of the decorative kale is actually edible. <laughs> Um, Swiss chard, the rainbow Swiss chard is beautiful. You grow that on your border and people will be, what is that? Well, you want to eat some? <laughs> um, let's see, greens, any of your greens, chives make a wonderful border. Uh, and don't forget your edible flowers like pansies and violets and nasturtiums and lavender. Those can all, those are all maybe right in your landscape right now and you don't even know they're edible. Do some research on what you got and you might be able to eat your front yard. <laughs> uh, so this is one article on foodscaping here. And this is an article on edible flowers. And we have more on the edible flowers and the herbs in one of our other, ooh, am I even doing that this year? Does anyone have the list? Am I doing an herbs presentation this year? Okay, all right. That seems to go, it's gone over pretty well with the past couple years. Um, we amend it and we change it and add some different recipes to it. So that's that's been one that's gone over really good. Um, and here again, here's the pointer. We'll cover more on the container and vertical gardening during our next month's presentation in April. So here's just a, a couple pictures. Here you have an espalier that's, I don't know if it's pears or apples, but that's a way to grow in your landscape and it looks pretty and it's a very unique conversation piece. Um, these people, I guess they don't use their driveway um, looks like they planted herbs up their driveway and they planted some kind of a vine on their fence and they probably have something in here too and there's some window boxes with things growing out of it and here's some strawberry vines growing out of a container, a hanging container. So you can, I mean you can put a p tomato, they have, what are they calling them, micro t tomatoes? They're like little <coughs> teeny tiny compact plants that have hundreds of little teeny tiny tomatoes on them. I don't know how they taste, but a, definitely something you can fit in just about it. In fact, they were saying you could grow it as a house plant. <laughs> if anyone does that, I'd like to know. Um, one thing that you're going to want to do, as a master gardener, I need to promote this, you need to test your soil. You don't have to send it to MSU, which is the link. Oh, I did the wrong one again. The link is right here. But um, Cahoon's has one that doesn't have as in-depth kind of a thing. But if you get an MSU soil test, you can take your sheet to Morgan's Composting. They can tell you exactly what you need in order to amend your soil for a particular crop. Um, we do that 
for the city, um, we we take soil samples different places where we might be having some trouble that we know we need amendments. We take it to Morgan's, they mix up what we want. Of course, we buy it in like bulk. <laughs> but um, they can do that for you. Morgan's is so awesome. Don't they have a second place now too? Oh, there's five. There's five of them in Michigan. So you don't have to go down to Monroe? Uh, Everett. Okay. Okay. Yeah, look up Monroe Composting. They're having a lot of classes now too. And they're awesome. I would love to go one to one of their day long kind of seminar things. But where are we at? Okay. Yay, that's it. Ooh, I'm on time. <laughs>